Welcome to the Church of Perpetual Life, everyone. Around the world, we have people all over the place. And I'm so glad that you are all here. I was amazed that uh, we had so many people registering and so many at the last moment. I think we have nearly 100 people in our Zoom. And I know we'll hit 1,000 that will watch this video by the end of the month, if not more. My name is Neil Vandry, and I am your officiator here at the Church of Perpetual Life. And for those of you who are here for the first time, that's sort of like the minister in a church that is not a Bible-based church. We are a transhumanist church. While some of our members are Christian and others are Jewish and others are atheist or agnostic, what unites all of us is the fact that we are working toward age reversal, the fact that we want to become one day immortalists, that is to mean to have unlimited lifespans. So here at the church, as we refer to ourselves as immortalists, we realize that we have not yet defeated death, that this is a goal that is in us, and we see future technologies bringing us the opportunity for disease and aging. And I look at aging as the ultimate disease that we must find a cure for. We've got a mission here, and that is to assist all people in the radical extension of healthy human life. We provide fellowship for longevity enthusiasts around the world. Joining now with us through this Zoom live stream are people from Holland and England, Australia, all over the USA and Canada. And we would like to let you know that we are here to support you in any meetups that you may want to create. Recently, one of our members is in, told us that they're in the process of creating the synagogue of perpetual life in Israel. And that's probably by the youngest rabbi in Israel that there is. He came here to perpetual life. We met, talked, and the energy was bouncing off the walls. And uh, now we're looking forward to seeing how well his synagogue is, is going. And I'll be in touch with that rabbi actually tomorrow. We follow Fedorov and Arthur C. Clarke. And let me give you our creed, if I may. If you have a copy of the creed, we're going to put it up on the screen for you so you can read along if you'd like. Be sure to go ahead and mute your microphones. But if you'd like to read with me, it's Perpetual Life Creed. We believe that all of life is sacred and that we have been given this one life to make unlimited. We believe in our Creator's divine plan for all of humanity to have infinite lifespans in perfect health and eternal joy, rendering death to be optional. By following our Gospels, we achieve eternal life, creating a heaven here on earth. We follow Nikolai Fedorov, who taught that the transcendence of the Creator will only be solved when humanity in our unified efforts become an instrument of universal resuscitation when the divine word becomes our divine action. And we follow Arthur C. Clarke, who said, the only way to discover the limits of the possible are to go beyond them into the impossible. And so we enter each day energized in spirit, empowered by the words of our prophets to live in joy, serving our Creator and all of mankind forever and ever. Fedorov believed, as we do here, that we should divert human energies away from wars, away from dissensions, toward measures of protecting mankind against natural disasters like floods and droughts, earthquakes, hurricanes and to transform nature from a temporary enemy into an, in, in, into an eternal friend. Now we look at death as the enemy. We want to transform disease and death into a, an opportunity, to, again, to create a heaven here on earth, rendering ourselves to live unlimited lifespans. We look at Arthur C. Clarke, he also said, many things that, uh, that, that we'll be quoting later on. Since death is a natural phenomenon, we know that it too should and will be overcome through knowledge and action. And so 
I find it as a job for all of us to find ways to reverse aging, to support people who are doing the research, to support organizations that are working toward the ultimate goal of creating an unlimited lifespan for all people. Fedorov states in his manifesto, that's a really bad word, isn't it? In his book, <laughs> it's a manifesto, but he states that man is an active creature and will always act. If man does not know what to do, then he will do what he should not do. Man will cease doing what he should not do only when he knows what to do. And man will give his energies to a cause when he regards it as his duty. Mankind will stop fighting when enough of society acknowledges it is possible and therefore obligatory to redirect energies now squandered on wars and relentless bickering toward the acts of universal salvation. This is our duty, the common task that Nikolai Fedorov wrote about over a hundred years ago. So we are actively accelerating the creator's plan of the common task of humanity to cultivate the technology that will facilitate and transform our lives into an environment of indefinite existence. At this time, it's important for me to point out a couple of our members and to do a little bit of house cleaning, cleaning before we get into our main event, that which you've been waiting for. First, I want to acknowledge Mark, Mark Locks, who do, who's now in the Over 500 Club, who's donated over $500. Thank you, Mark. And also Ken Weiss, who's in the Over $5,000 Club. We really appreciate all of the donations. And I want to thank all of you who have been continuing to support the Church of Perpetual Life throughout this horrible COVID-19 shutdown that we've been experiencing. Also want to let you know that our library is expanding in leaps and bounds. We've got a library over here that's got great things in it. You can't find in any other library or bookstore. When you come to the Church of Perpetual Life, you're welcome to get a library card, borrow a book. And I want to make a note of the fact that we've had several large donations. Thank you for your books. We're looking for more. If you have any books on health, longevity, cryonics, artificial intelligence, and science fiction that relates to the immortality and the possibility of universal uh, immortality. We'd love to have those books in our library. Our next service is scheduled to be an open microphone night once a year. I like every year to have once a year to be an open microphone night where our members all over the world can now join us in the virtual live stream, open microphone, just get in touch with me Send me an email, however you want to get in touch with me. I'm easy guy to find. Just Google me, you'll find me. And I would be very happy to make you part of our open microphone night. Typically, that means five to seven minutes to present something as it relates to age reversal, the destruction of awful diseases, something that will help us live healthier, longer, happier lives, anything to do with artificial intelligence and those type of topics. If you think that you have something that would be of interest and would like to give a presentation in our open microphone night next month, please get in touch with me. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get started, there's one more thing I need to do, and that is to remind you that we at Perpetual Life do not endorse any business, business practice or political field. So we don't do that here. We want you to think for yourselves to take charge of your health. We want you to live as long and as healthy as possible. Now, people in authority are always telling us what they think we should do, what they think you need to do. But in the final analysis, really, it's our own selves that determine our good health. It's our own choices that determine our own longevity. It's your decision. And here at the church, we want you to use food as medicine, not as poison, to catch longevity escape velocity and to live to be the healthiest 200-year-old person here on the planet. We're not going to tell you what to do, but we will offer many suggestions. So our members, some of them are carnivores. Some of them are vegan. I will 
tell you what I am or what I believe because I don't want to impact what you think you should do. Unless, of course, you, you know, buy you'll find out. But I would like to now bring up our speaker for the evening, someone who we've been waiting for and are so happy to have with us here tonight. A typical American growing up in the New Jersey, New York area, Brian likes to joke that he was a pioneer in the field of obesity. He was fat even before many Americans were fat. Raised in an Irish household on the standard American diet of meat, processed food, and sugary sodas. He was unfit and gasping for air every few steps. When he was 20 years old, he was dating a girl whose best friend's boyfriend was 30 and a vegetarian. Despite the fact he had been more or less educated by his family that the body would die without animal-based foods, the lure of an influential peer inspired him to give up meat in one fell swoop. For the first year and a half, he kept his vegetarian diet a secret from his family. Yet, after losing 120 pounds and experiencing the difference in his health, he came out of the closet, much to his family's dismay, and became a complete vegan three years later. A natural performer, Brian had worked his way through college as a musician. Many friends, including one who shared his interest in nutrition after healing herself from cancer through diet, offered feedback that he was born to teach. With his degree in biochemistry in hand and his interest in nutrition sealed, Brian began doing just that. And now let's welcome from the Hippocrates Health Institute, Brian Clemens. Nice to be with everyone out there. Thank you so much. It's, it's always good to be with an organization and to share my current ideas that I concur with, uh, that you could not have said it any better, that the ultimate disease is death. And uh, as you know, Harvard University basically called it a disease and put it in a different category just three or four years ago. And once that happens, it opens up the watershed for each and every one of us to look at the potentiality of long lives that are not lives that become less, but become more. Uh, many of us listening today have matured. And can you imagine if you had the body and the vitality and the vigor you had at 20 with the knowledge and the experience that you have today. And I don't think that nature and the universe basically created a human being so that it could eventually uh, fall apart and not have a memory and not be able to walk and talk and end up in a hospital bed. And before you know it, uh, being kept on artificial life. So we're going to discuss some of those things with you tonight, and we'll take a little voyage through the Institute I've had the privilege to direct since 1980, and that's Hippocrates Health Institute. And it goes back to the 1950s. And uh, the 1950s were an interesting time. I was a little guy at that point, and everything was sort of neat, clean, orderly, and boring. But our founder, who was caught in that culture at that point, wasn't feeling well and went up to see the doctors at Harvard and was told she had just 90 days to live. Now, that didn't make her feel very good at 50 years old. And she recalls what she watched her grandmother, the village doctor, perform as a physician back in Europe. And all doctors then were what we would call natural or naturopathic doctors. They used herbs, they used food, they used love and emotional support. And she did that and she healed herself. And in 1956, she had the wisdom to say what was lacking in healthcare was self-care. That even the natural field was about codependency. Come to me, pay me, I make you well. And she said, that's a broken model. It will never ultimately work. Because one she, thing she observed is that the doctor doesn't come home with you. 
the doctor doesn't make sure that you're eating right and thinking right and exercising and, and taking care of yourself. So that's why the word doctor comes from the derivative teacher has been completely abandoned. If a doctor could teach the people that come to him for advice and help, or she, the doctor, can help that person by saying, here's what we've learned here in my practice and in the world of science, as your foundation is doing, that keeps you living longer. Now, remember, it's synonymous when we talk about long life means absence of disease, because hardly anyone dies without dying from a disease. And disease comes from the derivative of disorder. So somehow we've created disorder, a lack of order within our bodily systems, and I believe emotional system, that we literally have become slaves to patterns of deception, that the most deceptive thing, in my opinion, is a system that tells you that they can assist you to be well, that most often fails, and we have the data to show that today. The number three killer, not only here in the United States, but all of the developed world, the only other one that supersedes, or two that superseded, are cancer, and heart disease is pharmaceutical mistakes. Now think about this. This is a system that's supposed to be making us live longer, the system that's supposed to be advising us on how to reverse diseases. And what I've just told you, which is factual, it's a number three killer today. So no wonder we're confused. No wonder, one we're, well, uh, no wonder we're suffering. And more importantly, no wonder we believe the old paradigm, as we get old, we become decrepit. As we become old, we become non-important, that they shelve us in nursing homes. They don't take us serious. They put us in a position where our validity is gone. And before you know it, even the most courageous woman or courageous man in the world is going to lose faith in life. So we'll start with that. The people that I've worked with over the 51 years I've done this that have lived 100 and beyond, and there's about, I was thinking about this today coming here, about 380 or so. I've found the commonality, the thread that allowed them to live these long and abundant lives. And as a nutritional scientist, you'd think I would start with nutrition, but I'm not. I'm going to start with affirmative attitudes. So the number one way that we live long lives is not buy into the scheme that when you get old, you become dysfunctional. As a matter of fact, when you become old, you become more capable and you should be more functional at that point. The inverse of what we believe in our social norm is today. If you can get affirmative thought, it creates affirmative action, but a different kind of affirmative action. This is an, uh, an idea in your mind that says at 90, at 100, at 110, which are super centurions, as you know today, uh, that we, if we want to walk up a mountain and it's 10 miles, we can do that. If we want to make love and participate, we can do that. So this is not a small thing. To me, it's everything. As a matter of fact, right there at the church of perpetual life, you are affirmative action in action. You're literally saying that we don't buy into this, that we literally are going to break this system down, move it out of the way, and show that the human body has the potentiality to be perpetual. Perpetual means constant redevelopment. Now, Here's a fact that many of you may not know. It wasn't until just a few years ago when science showed us why we age, uh, that we started to understand this at some level. Because what was confusing to all of us that understand biology, physiology, and anatomy is that if the body regenerates every seven years and new stem cells come in, 
and create everything from your bones to your organ systems to the skin we're all looking at on each other's bodies there, the largest organ. Why then does it stop regenerating? So when they went back and they started to understand there were components within the body, the cells, called mitochondria. They, with Blackburn's work and others around the world, the telomeres have become one of the measurements, not the only, one of the measurements on aging or, or premature aging. And they started to realize there were many cofactors in that shorten the telomeres, meaning shorten the lifespan, or disembarked or disfueled the mitochondria, which is the energy source of every cell. And they were all common on both of these. Number one was lack of rest and sleep. If you want to age somebody really, really rapidly, keep them up. Don't allow them to sleep the hours that they require. Now, this has become a science right here at the Institute. We have a sleep program now because it's become a major problem. Six out of 10 people I talk to are not sleeping adequately. And that's a global concern. And what they find is that the hormones, including other chemistries like melatonin in the brain, if they don't have the rest and the ability to replenish itself, it starts to erode the energy within the cell and shorten the mitochondria. But really what that's coming from is destroying the DNA, RNA, and the immune function of the human body. The second thing they found out with longevity is communication and community were as important as food, exercise, and sleep. And this has been overlooked until recently, and I'm very proud that they're opening their minds. And to me, the most impressive study on longevity I've ever read was only published two or three years ago. It's called the New England Centenary Study, and they looked at 100-year-olds, and they looked also at 110-year-olds. And there it was that people who had close friends and community lived longer. And it was one of the major components in that. So having the uh, Perpetual Life Church is a community. And with new technology, it's not as good as we're all in the room together and hugging and kissing and loving one another. But you must connect to these communities that have like-mindedness, that have the optimistic view and the vision and the affirmative action and thinking that we can achieve something that hasn't been achieved, just like Einstein did in the past. You know, he was laughed at when he, he began to talk about his theory of relativity. And the quantum biologists were laughed at. And people who basically said at one point, we can take a human heart out and we can replace it and the person can live again, we're laughed at when that was done for the first time in South Africa. But we're not laughing anymore. This became common practice. Well, someday soon, if we all as a community come together, have affirmative thought and work to globally spread this type of enthusiasm, the common sense approach of believing that we can live without pain, suffering and disease is going to be matter of fact understood, not questioned. When most people out there in the world presently hear people like us speak, they think we're crazy. But don't you think it's more crazy to think it's okay to die early, okay to be sick, okay to be decrepit? That's the crazy person. Even if I was delusionary, I'd be a lot more sane to think I should live longer. The next thing we'll talk about is what I have deep experience in and a doctorate degree in, and that's nutrition. And as my introduction came, we talked about me going from a destructive diet to a body and mind building diet. And let me repeat, diet does not only have to do with the anatomy, it has equal importance in the psychology, the brain function, the consciousness, and all of the other things. And if you read theology, they basically have stated this for thousands of years. It's right there. But we all ignore this in some way. Now, what I will say about food, it comes down to natural history 
and Earth history. And I want you to listen very, very closely. And I'll repeat this twice so that we all get it. You are alive. I am alive. The energy in that computer is projecting all of us from thousands of miles away. The chairs you're sitting in, everything you see, touch, feel, understand, comes from photons from the sun. So the sun is the star that rains down life and the potentiality of life for everything on the planet Earth. Now, with that said, when you look at that, the photon comes from a proton. And the proton takes 100,000 years to reach the surface of the sun. Right now in the center of the sun, endless zillions, because we don't have a way to count. We don't have a concept of how many, endless. Zillions of protons are born. They bounce back and forth on neutrons. That creates a friction. So now in the summer season, in most parts of the world, when you go outside and feel that radiating heat, you're actually feeling from the origin of the proton and neutron bouncing back and forth, the vibrational frequency happening. But this happens in the gastric sun, which is 98% gas, only 2% matter, for 100,000 years. It reaches the surface and shoots off so fast, it goes from matter to light. Isn't that amazing? And that light travels rapidly for eight and a half minutes, it reaches the Earth. Now we get back to the diet part of this story. What evolved on the planet Earth to capture the energy from the sun, which is how every piece of you, every piece of everything you see, touch, feel, and understand on this planet came from. What was developed is green leafy plants. This is not an opinion. This is earth history, natural history, and biology. So the origin of all nutrients begin with green leafy plants. Now, the next step is the human body has the ability to digest green leafy plants unlike any other thing we have chosen over millennia to start to chew and swallow. And how we can affirm this here at Hippocrates is because we've been putting people for over 65 years on a pure, unadulterated plant-based diet and clinically researching. Unlike other people who have theories, we do clinical research and now have done this on hundreds of thousands of people and watch the end result through not only blood profiles, but sophisticated scanning that we do here and report back from these individuals who come from all over the planet Earth, from their doctors, when they have reversed diseases, when they come back, 80% of our guests return in, thank God many of them come just to be in this community, to holiday and to be with like-minded people, to, to live in a harmonious way, a longevity-seeking community. And the differences in the way these people articulate, look, act, and the energies they expel are shockingly phenomenal most of the time. Just yesterday, I was telling a story to the uh, guests that are here in our comprehensive cancer program about a woman that came 31 years ago down from Toronto, Canada. Uh, she happened to, at that point, go to the top doctor in Canada for oncology, who was at the university in Toronto, who had a great reputation. This was a a mainstream doctor, not a complimentary or progressive doctor, but she was an honest woman. And she sat with this poor woman who had stage four pancreatic cancer. And she was candid. She said, we can give you palliative care at best, but you will not survive. So she came into my office, the office that I'm speaking to you from right now, and cried and cried and cried. And I cried a little bit because, you know, you can't be around somebody in that much deep sorrow that it doesn't affect you, it doesn't get empathy to come up and compassion. And she said, I can't die. Uh, my last daughter just got out of school. They're all doing well. My husband abandoned me. None of our family's alive. They'd have nobody if I die. And I said, but you don't have to die. 
She said, but you know, I went to the top doctor and I talked to five other doctors and all of them told me that this is a hopeless situation. So let's focus in on that a minute. So here's medical doctors that are in, a, in an incredibly important position to encourage people to live and to recover. And almost all of them, when they face these kind of unbelievably catastrophic diseases, immediately tell the patient that they're going to die. Now, what do you think that does to the psyche of the patient? You think that renders optimism in the person? <laughs> and, and she said, but I, I, it's hard for me to believe you. And I said, but you don't need to believe me. I'm not interested in you believing me. I believe me. That's all that matters. I'm interested in you believing that you can heal yourself, or I can promise you it's impossible for you to do that. Me knowing you can heal, me believing you can heal, has no bearing on your recovery. And somehow she got it. She healed herself, as I've seen so many from pancreatic cancer, brain cancer, uh, and more important than all of that is premature aging. This year I'm 70, going on 20. I have more energy than I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, and she's 87 and sexy. And she keeps saying, I want to do more. I want to do more. Most people after they're 70, 80 years old, they're looking for ways out. They need to rest. They need pause in their life. If you have more experience, more enthusiasm, and more energy, why the heck would you want to pause? You want to hit the accelerator. And part of why people age is we're not hitting the accelerator and believing ourselves that we can heal that we can live long lives. This is powerfully important in longevity. The next thing we'll talk about is movement and exercise. You know, too many people look for the quick fix. Let's look at the greatest herb or injection or some medicine that's gonna make me live longer. All of that is by far down on the list five, six, seven, and eight. What we're talking about now is number one, attitude. Number two, community. Number three, energized food that's going to wake up every cell in the body and create healthy organisms so that you literally can sustain the so-called aging process. But movement and exercise are paramount. The book that I published out of my 30 books last year with my wife was called menopause, rather than the scientific word andropause. And I did that as a response to the little response, almost negligible response, I got from several of my physician friends and from the, the people I know and love in the public. I asked them, how many of you know that men start menopause or andropause at 25 years old? Most of them challenged me. They had no opinion. They didn't know about it, but they couldn't believe that. So we're always saying about women, oh, they're 45 years old, 50, they're getting menopause, and oh, this is what happens to them. Ladies, listen clear. Men, open-minded men, listen clear. You begin this process at 25 years old. So up until we're 25, we have these hormonal virility ideologies in our head because we can fuel it with hormones, which in one of my books, Life Force, I call the language of the body. It's how cells communicate with one another. And you better have the hormones straight, man. You don't, and the cells don't communicate, they start to die. They start to suffer. They start to age, prematurely age. And so what we understand is that muscle, listen closely, muscle, which you can develop at 110 the same way you can at 10. You're going to challenge this. You're wrong. At 110, you can develop muscle the same exact way you can at 10 years old or 15 or 20 years old. The difference is to maintain it because at best, when we're healthy as heck, eating well, maybe supplementing with some natural hormone therapies or some kind of food-based supplements that are propelling hormonal development in the endocrine system, it doesn't sustain. So I may pump up my muscles and then they go down very rapidly. Unlike a 20 or 30 year old who basically can exercise muscles and it may maintain for three, four or five days before they have to do that again. So the muscle makes the brain and the memory maintain, the heart maintain, and the libido maintain. Let me tell you, one of the saddest things I see with people who are prematurely aging is they talk to me about 
the lack of intimacy they have. And one of the sure ways to accelerate aging is not to be able to make love, not to be able to share. Go back to community, number two again. That's an intimate community you have. And by the way, we all need to express ourselves in a loving way. And when a woman or man lacks that ability to have intimacy, they surely feel like they're old because that's what the dogma says. That's what the social abnormality says. And here's how scary this is, so you know the numbers. Maybe we have a group of people here that believe we can fight all of this and beat it, which I completely, I'm one of the leaders, I believe that. But 40-year-old young men in Western Europe and the United States, 50% cannot sexually perform. So what do you think a 40-year-old man who can't sexually perform, and who, by the way, has an idea that he's virile because he's watched a lot of John Wayne movies and Clint Eastwood movies, and, you know, he, he believes he's got to be a sexual object, he's got to be macho, and he's got to be in control, but he doesn't have the biological ability to do that. Well, that does a number on your head. So there's an exercise that's powerful. By the way, the side effect of that, osteoporosis goes away. Side effect of that, you look good. Side effect of that, your mobility is better. Your balance is better. How many of you know after 50 years old, the average person reduces their stability by 1%. You become more feeble after 50 years old by 1% a year. When you're 60, you're 10% more feeble. 70, 20% more feeble. 80, one third more feeble. Now think about that. But by the way, if you have muscle and do aerobic exercise, which we're now moving into, the feeblity rate drops down to one third of one point. So you're dropping it down one third. And I'm sure there's ways to beat that with, with technologies today that we're used, utilizing right here on the Hippocrates campus. And when you start to see how we can vibrate the body's neurological system, get balanced and coordinate with the brainstem and the neurons in the brain, that creates the balance. The aerobic exercise, as we know, was always consistently done by every human being on the earth until we created the industrial revolution, now the technological revolution, because we had to exercise since we made our lives work by farming, by collecting food, by walking. We didn't have cars. You know, bicycles were like a wild invention at the beginning. You know, people were exercising. And the fact is, very few people exercise. The data is unbelievable. Only 5% of the population in North America, Western Europe, and the developed world in Asia, et cetera, are exercising adequately. So if we don't circulate the bloodstream, the stem cells don't come out. Stem cells are the baby cells who make you young, fresh, and renew and keep away the aging process. Circulation is what makes that happen. And in fact, when you do aerobic exercise, you stimulate more stem cell activity and development within the bone marrow that, by the way, provide more potentiality to slow the aging process. Now, these aren't ideas and theories. These are most scientifically validated ideas we understand when it comes to lifestyle and aging. The next thing, and as we mature, it's even more important than the year before, is what? Stretching. Now, thank God yoga and Pilates are popular today, but I don't even do them. I do all kinds of exercise, but I don't take the time to do those. But I do stretching because stretching and mobility is a great way to lock up the body when you're not doing it. And we learned just two and a half years ago that you can buy a bar for about $10, even if you don't have a gym you go to or equipment in your home, you put it across a high door you have hold on to it and drop your body and try to hold it 40, come down off it, 40, come down off it and 40. What that does is realigns the spine, helps to improve and maintain the posture of the body. And once again, get the neurons from the brain going down the nervous system as you'd see osteopathic or chiropractic doctors talk about the relationship between nerves and organ systems to function. So that's the package of what humans require today in lifestyle to have the beginning foundation of having a long life without disease, without pain, without suffering. Now, yes, we can add supplementation on top of that. 
Yes, we can add, as we have here, an energy medicine department where we use lasers and electromagnetic frequencies and uh, brain mapping and brain tapping and, you know, Nucom and Undermed and everything you can possibly imagine, the state of the state of the art. But by the way, if I'm not having an affirmative thought, having community in my life, relationships, partnerships, et cetera, eating clean, progressive food that makes my body healthy and tuning into the electrical life force that comes from photons from the sun and moving and exercising and developing the strength of my body, all of the rest of it will ultimately fail. We're not gonna, we're not gonna dream our way to live a long life. You have to work your butt off to have a long life. You know? And at first it's hard. Some of you listening to us around the world today, this is new for you. You're interested in what we're saying, but I'm gonna tell you straight on, the first year, two, three, four years of you embracing an affirmative lifestyle, not just an affirmative attitude, not good enough to have an affirmative attitude. Remember the, the word I came up with? Affirmative action. Affirmative attitude, affirmative action of relationship, action of selecting the proper food, preparing the proper selection of, you know, movement exercise is your friend. It took me a long time. I was just a baby when I started this. And it took me a long time to embrace it because I was in a sedentary mindset. I was like everyone else I knew, everyone else I saw. They were slowly dying and humming kumbaya along the way and thinking it was perfectly fine and putting their lives in the hand of science and basically saying, if they say we all age, if they say we die at 70, if they say we die at 80, that's what we're going to do. Because that's what I saw my grandfather do and I saw my grandmother do and my mother and my father. And that's what I see happen. But here's the problem, people. Because we haven't taken our lifestyle serious, now we're dying and suffering at much, much, much younger ages. The life expectancy in the last five years have gone down five years. Think of what I'm telling you. During this fiasco, the 19 virus globally, in one year, we reduced the lifespan by one year. That's never happened in the history of humanity before. And we're sitting here talking about living a long life. Well, why that is, is the people who had that virus and died from that virus basically had diseases. They were obese. They were diabetic. They had some kind of secondary problem. What about if you had a lifestyle of integrity and you didn't have that? Well, the example is the virus wouldn't have killed you. But guess what? Aging is not going to kill you. Because the number one, let's repeat again, cause of premature death is disorder and disease. It's not God says, hey, they're getting old. Let's take them out of the picture. There's a lot of doomsdayers out there that say we can't sustain the amount of people if we had double and triple. It. I will show you in five minutes we could sustain it with foods that are perpetual, just like perpetual life, foods that you can replenish. There's algaes. I take five types of algaes to supplement a day. You take a foot out of it, out of the, out of the lake a day. The next day, the same foot's back there again. The highest protein food in the world, energy food in the world, I'm talking about now. They say, well, I don't like algae. I like eclairs. Well, don't expect to live a long life if you like eclairs and fast food and soda and booze. You're not going to live a long life with that. You're going to fool yourself. This will be a hobby for you. If this is a hobby for you, I'm sorry for you. This is not a hobby for me. This is my entire life to be healthy, to be alive, to be vital. And why? Not just because I, I'm interested in living a long life. I'm interested in contributing. I'm interested in learning more. I'm interested in growing more. I'm interested in sharing more. That's why we're here on the planet Earth, people. And unless you have that aspiration, unless that's your driving force, it's going to be difficult for you to take responsibility and to do things that are initially really, really hard. I'm not suggesting this isn't because the world doesn't say we want you to live long. The world tells you you should die soon. I do a two hour presentation called Fear Creates Disease. Listen closely. I show them. The entire economy of the world is based on death and dying businesses. Let me repeat this again. I do a two-hour presentation called Fear Creates Disease. I show them that the major 
economic powerhouses all have to do with death and dying. Let's go through the list. Number one is the war industry. They wipe people out quick like this, death and dying immediately. Number two is the meat and dairy industry. Number three is the pharmaceutical industry. Number three is four is the chemical industry. You get the gist of what I'm saying to you? And this is where we have based the economy of the world on. If we tomorrow with a magic wand got rid of all of the death and dying businesses, the entire world economy would collapse. So let's, by the way, create a new world economy that's on life, not survival, but thriving, longevity, health, well-being, and as you said so well in the introduction, peace and harmony. You know, peace and harmony was, you know, relegated to hippies. Why the hell don't all of us want peace and harmony? You know, the fact of the matter is, you know, if you don't have peace and harmony, you're not going to have mental clarity. You're not going to have the wherewithal, the initiative, or the energy to achieve a healthy existence. It just cannot happen. And the truth of the matter is that all of this is within your reach, within an inch from where you sit at this point. The real challenge I give you, do you have the willingness to make the commitment to yourself to achieve the dream that you assume that you have? You only assume you have it until you work on that dream and then ultimately achieve that dream. I'll never forget, I was talking to my friend, 107-year-old friend about six months ago, and uh, we were having this very interesting conversation. And I said, what, what's it like? How long do you really remember? And he remembered the last 90 years. Can you imagine remembering 90 years? He really remembers it. He was like a teenager, he started to remember things. And he said, in my, my short life, that's, I love he said that, <laughs> rather than say, wow, this long life I've had. He started the conversation by, in this short life I've had, do you know the changes I've seen? And he went on to say to me, the most interesting thing is how difficult it was for me to accept the new world, the new changes. But I realized as a young man in my 20s, if I didn't open up my mind and open up my heart, my heart and open up my imagination, I was going to be left behind. And he gave me a beautiful vision. I almost cried when he said this to me. He said, one thing I realized that if life is a river and I'm left behind in the river, I'm not going to move forward. He said, so in my 20s, I recognized as more as difficult as it was and, and more uh, disharmonious to my state of art status quo that I desired, you know, I was going to let go. And at the end of the conversation, he concluded without me urging him on that why he's lived that long, 107 years, is because he's allowing life to occur and learning how to embrace what happens. Rather than saying, look it, my destiny is to go along with this. He finds ways to love it. I found myself a few years ago saying, boy, I really can't enjoy rap music. I said, there I am, I'm jumping off the boat. I'm starting to age, <laughs> this is it. I mean, I disdained it to be honest with you. I'm a musician, <laughs> I like rap music now. The one I'm still struggling with is heavy metal. <laughs> Can't get that one yet. <laughs> but the, the reality is I realize what's going on around me, the frequency and vibration of the human consciousness today when I listen to the youth. You know, Mozart composed his first symphony at five years old. We're listening to that symphony today, hundreds of years after Mozart. That's remarkable. You think Mozart wasn't in the river? Mozart was actually in a speedboat asking the river to follow him. <laughs> That's what we have to have. That's where you need to be. Don't tell me it's difficult. What's difficult is to suffer and to die and to die prematurely and to not live a life where you fulfill it before you leave. How many of you really, really, really feel fulfilled? Have you achieved your goals? Are you contributing at the level you want? 
Have you told everyone that you love and loves you that you love them or not? And if not, it's not time for you to go. It's never time for a person to go who's doing something they love. So what did I just say? The most important thing I've just said to you all night, I just said in that sentence. There's no time a person wants to go when they're doing what they love. So your first marching orders is to find what you love, to commit yourself to what you love, to fuel your life with a lifestyle of integrity that we spoke about, and recognize that nobody knows everything there is to know. But guess what? Tomorrow, there's more room to learn what we want to learn. So that's what I have to say to you tonight. And so thanks for, for listening to me. Great, great, Brian. You know, it's always so wonderful to have you here. Thank you for giving us your time and your wisdom and your experience. And at this time, we'd like to open the floor to questions and answers. The first question is, can Dr. Clement explain what are natural, uh, what are remedies? What are remedies for a person with adult leukemia? Maybe you have some ideas of how someone can beat leukemia. Okay, so what you have to understand, there's two types of cancers, although we have many names for cancers, sarcoma, melanoma, carcinoma, they're solid mass cancers. So you can see them in tissue. Uh, leukemia is a floating cancer. It's sort of like a moving target, or as, as uh, Shakespeare would have said, a moving feast. Now, the body doesn't care. When I say the body, I specifically mean the intelligent immune system. The immune system is how cancers reverse. And I'll tell a story. 40 years ago, 30 years ago, when I would be out at university speaking, and I was telling uh, case studies, because you know, we've had thousands of people, not 100, thousands of people come here and reverse cancer, that the immune system did that, I would almost be booed off the stage and laughed off the stage. Now, because the public, as you say, is becoming more intelligent, they're starting to question why would I do chemotherapy and radiation that give me cancer in the conquest of fighting cancer? So about 25 years ago, they realized that the new generations are going to start challenged. And they started to do studies on what? Boosting the immune system. And the terminology they use now is immunotherapy. Now, do we have to immediately go to experimental immunotherapy or do we have to look at the biological work that we've been doing here for 65 years. Now, let me explain what you have to do to get the immune system engaged. Number one, you have to make sure that this army is well rested, well fed, well hydrated. We haven't touched hydration tonight because 70% of your body is water and your plasma, your blood is carried with water. How many of you know that, for instance, Inside of your bones, 20% of your bone is water. My God, you think the bone is completely like a solid rock. How many of you realize 80% of your brain is water? Important to you. And guess what? The number one conductor of electromagnetic frequency is water. That's why when a lightning storm comes, you don't jump in the pool, you jump out of the pool. So the electromagnetic currents that stimulate and the movement and the coordination of the immune cells, eosinophils, basophils, neutrocytes, grandocytes, all of these things that fight the cancer have to have those elements there. And to stimulate them, there are certain phytochemicals. Now, let's go back and talk about one of the most interesting ones to me. I just gave a class on this the other day. Uh, way back in the 1980s, when the pharmaceutical industry started to realize the young generation wasn't going to buy into their nonsense, they started to commission studies from major universities. And one of the most impressive ones was Johns Hopkins. And Hopkins uh, was given a large sum of money and they were asked to find a natural methodology to reverse all forms of cancer, including leukemia. And they studied the world's population and cancer ratios and found a really interesting thing. In Russia, they had as much cancer as us and they ate a horrible diet like us, but it was even worse because they all washed it down with vodka. And so, but they found a, a little section of Russia that had the same horrible diet and the same vodka, and it was darker there and colder there and everything else. And they had a double digit less cancer of all types than did the rest of Russia. And they 
focused in on cabbage family, that they were eating a more traditional diet that the Russians would have 100 years ago, maybe. And they focused in on it and found an element, a phytochemical in it called sulforaphane, S-U-L-F-O-R-I-A-N-E, sulforaphane. So I'll speed this up. There's been hundreds of studies at hundreds and hundreds of laboratories and universities I think this is the greatest thing we ever found in the history of, of cancer research. Matter of fact, Johns Hopkins, by the, the end of the five-year study, coined the name phyto, that means plant chemo. Now, where do you get most of this? I just told you the cabbage family. Let's name what the cabbage family is, because many of you may not know, because you've been eating McDonald's all of the time. It's cabbage itself. It's Brussels sprouts. The way my, my Irish family got me to eat that is they said there were baby carrots. Baby cabbages. <laughs> the next one would be broccoli, which, by the way, was cultivated by man. Broccoli is not an original plant. Cauliflower, the same. But here are ones that people, kale is part of that family. Collard greens are part of that family. Mustard greens are part of that family. And now, if you think you're going to get benefit from the question I ask, if I cook it and process it and heat it and bake it, Am I gonna get benefit from it? The answer is no. So now the leading institute on the entire planet is the Linus Pauling Institute on this, who moved from the Stanford campus in California to Oregon State University's alma mater. And what they're saying is once you heat these foods, this phytochemical and all the hundreds and hundreds of phytochemicals we've discovered that fight not only cancers, but fight heart disease and diabetes and aging and everything else, kaput. 115, kaput, gone. So sulforaphane, sulforaphane is what you need. But where is it most available? In the sprouts. So you get cabbage seeds, broccoli seeds, and you sprout it, listen closely. They have 50 times, five zero times more sulforaphane, which is now considered the most effective anti-cancer agent. I'll repeat it the most effective anti-cancer agent mainstream science has ever studied in the history of cancer research. This is called by one of my friends, the most important man in cancer research alive today, Thomas Seifrey, formerly Yale, Boston College now. This is the missing link. So we didn't even know why in the 1950s people were coming here and getting it. But guess what? We've been feeding people sprouts. And our founder wasn't a nutritional scientist. She was a woman who healed her stage four cancer after Harvard told her she was going to die. And she instinctually, because she was a country girl from the, the countryside of Europe, we've lost that kind of common sense. She had it. That's why we were lucky to do that. And by the way, now I write books on this. If you're an egghead, you say you have a lot of intellectuals there. All you intellectuals, I write books for you. Uh, I have a three-volume series, academic. They're musty. They're stinky. They look just like the damn <laughs> heavy books that you carried around at university. They're called Food is Medicine. And it will tell you why you reverse leukemia and every other disease from food, more importantly than anything else. Thank you, Brian. We have a question from one of our members who had COVID during the summer. And it was for about three months long. Turns out that they did have an underlying condition. And it says, I got it last July, so it's almost a year, and still have trouble with my stamina. I feel like, scroll down here, I feel like I had it a life before COVID, and now after COVID, I used to have a lot more energy. Have you heard of this happening? Uh, and oh, yeah, all, all of the time. As a matter of fact, it's a secondary disorder that we're writing about in, in, in the science literature today. Uh, the people who have come here, you know, we've never closed. Uh, we've tested every guest that participated. We've never worn masks because everyone on the campus was free of COVID. And uh, but we've had about two dozen people who had it. All of them tell me the same story in different variation. They're dragging their butt is in plain English what they're saying. Now, where does this individual live? Do you know? I don't have the answer on that. So. Number one, listen closely, hyperbaric chambers. So when they come here, we stick them in the hyperbaric chamber. There's not one exception that within a matter of five to seven treatments, 
these people no longer were feeling that way. Because you, what has happened, I'm going to try to make this simple for you. The 19 virus attacks the hems in your red blood cell. The hems are actually what create hemoglobin. And it injures them. It actually injures the tissue. And you get scar tissue in the red blood cell, the existing red blood cell. Now, they'll eventually uh, replenish themselves, but it may take a very long time, not months, but even a couple of years. In the process of doing that, if you oversaturate um, oxygen, and let me tell you the beauty of uh, hyperbaric chambers. Hyperbaric chambers don't pump oxygen into you. They actually get your body to think you're underwater and trick it so that the body says, you idiot, you're going to drown because you're below sea level and starts to produce thousands, tens of thousands of times more stem cells than it normally would. And guess what those babies carry? Oxygen. With them. So that's number one. Now, the other thing right here on my desk, I think this is a study I was reading where they looked at 187 people who had full blast 19 virus, very high dose, but they had exceptionally high vitamin D. Above average, not one of them had symptoms. So that, that tells us immediately you have to take a food-based, not the garbage you buy at most health stores, but a food-based form of vitamin D, the one we create and, and utilize made out of a vine, a living vine. That's very important. Zinc, I take zinc all of the time. Why my hair hasn't changed color at 70? I've been taking zinc like a maniac because it prevents, it strengthens your immune system, prevents viruses and, and colds and everything else ever since I was a baby. And so that's a big one. And then the other thing you have to understand is when we have a mindset that says, I had a pre-COVID life and I have a post-COVID life. As soon as you start to do all of the things we've discussed and eat a better diet and, you know, uh, reduce that disease that you had that was a secondary cause of it, and your attitude will change. And to do that, maybe I'll give you a little chemistry. To There's a wonderful uh, herb that you can get out of every good health store or on the internet called 5-HTP. 5-HTP is a bean out of Africa. It, uh, clinically, uh, all the research shows it does better than any uh, psychiatric medicine on the market for antidepressant. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Member is trying to heal their teeth and gums, and their dentist wants to do some stuff that she would prefer to avoid. Do you have any ideas? That she well, no, th this is another scary thing. I mean, Hebrew University just three months ago published a study. It's a done deal now. We all alluded to it over the decades that, you know, periodontal disease uh, creates cancer and heart attacks. But now we have proof of it. They looked at f four major cancers, major organ cancers, and found the bacterium from the, from the mouth, from the gums, in the cancer cell. So come on, that's a done deal. So we don't want to mess around with this. You're talking about longevity. Your teeth will kill you quicker than most people. Now, here's a scary number. After the young age of 50, that was 20 years ago for me, 50 years old, you basically, 90% of you have periodontal disease. Now, it's not only bacterium, but it's also something called the spiral key. We did research here 28 years ago with our microscopes for a company, the largest cerebral company in the world, and they created a product that helps to wipe that out. It's called Perio Paste and Perio Script. Write it down, people. I'll say it again. Perio Paste and Perio Script. Number two, if you're using a toothbrush, dump it. Get a water pick. Water picks, any legitimate orthodontist, legitimate dentist, a progressive woman or man that does that work, we're going to tell you, look at Toothbrush don't, doesn't do anything. The water pick stimulates blood flow, the stem cells up there, and literally you put two or three drops of that perio script herbal, it kills all of those bacteria in your mouth and starts to reverse periodontal disease. Of course, you got to get rid of sugar. That's why you have the damn periodontal disease. You got to get rid of carbohydrates, that, making you fat and stupid and dumb. You know, what are they? Potatoes, breads, pasta. Oh, how about the donuts? You know, my old thing, my bagels, all that, that stuff's got to go. <laughs> that doesn't go, forget it. You know, pretty much any grain product has to go out of your diet with this stuff. And then you have to remember, there's other sugar. You say, well, I don't eat sugar. Yes, you do. You eat honey. That's sugar. You eat maple syrup. That's sugar. I don't eat any sugar. I don't eat any fruit in my diet. Sugar degradates the body. I have a chapter in my academic books called Food is Medicine. I show you how fruit ages you. Why? Because it's been high bread. It's, it's a great, great food. 
but they've hybrid it with so much sugar now it doesn't resemble the original fruit. So you can get rid of this. I've seen people when they open their mouth, I didn't want to stand 10 feet from them. The rotting flesh was that odorous that completely reversed it. But you've got to do this stuff, people. And if you're not willing to change your diet, you're probably going to still have that stuff. Get Dump the toothbrush today or tomorrow. Get that water pick. Put it right I, every night. Tonight when I go home, I'll put it, put it in between the teeth. It works as a dental floss. I have that perio script. You just need two drops in it. So pervasive in there. And you basically do that. If I had periodontal disease, I wouldn't do water pick in the morning and night. I do it three or four times a day. Yes. Very good. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And those are the conclusion of our questions for now. But I'd like to invite everyone in our Zoom and you, Brian, to join us into the Zoom after party where people can... Uh, get together and uh, they'll be asking you any questions that you may like to uh, interact with them on the chat box as well. And I'd like to remind everyone that we are still taking donations for our library. An amazing thing has happened. We are getting a space for a library that's going to be 10 times larger than the space that we've had. We have a larger space, so we've got room for many more books. What you may not know is that we've got uh, the, of the books that you've seen in our library, we've actually got double that in process. And we thank you all for the donations you've given to the library. And uh, those of you who have library books out since before COVID, don't worry about it. We don't have any fines. Just uh, look forward to seeing you back in the personal flesh. And uh, obviously come back with the book that, you, that you've that you borrowed when you're done with it. That's probably last month, but uh, we'll be very happy to see you all. Now, people have asked, when will we be meeting in person again here at Perpetual Life? We're not looking at anything before November. So uh, it's not going to be next month. It's not going to be until late fall, possibly November. It all depends on what happens with the, the COVID, COVID variant that we're watching. Obviously, we are a church of health and longevity. We don't want anybody to get sick in any way. We've got a thousand masks here at the church. If anyone needs face masks, we've got masks for you. Let, let me know. We'll get those masks to you in some way. Again, our next service will be in July 22nd, the fourth Thursday, as usual. And we will have an open microphone night. If you'd like to speak, let me know, and we'll arrange that. We're looking forward to having Tanya as our hostess again for the Zoom party next month. And now I'd like to turn the portion uh, this portion over to our closer and uh, we're going to I think we have a little music don't we Douglas it's called forever young may the good Lord be with you down on every road you roll and may sunshine and happiness surround you and you're far from home May you grow to be proud, dignified and true And do unto others as you'd have done to you Be courageous and be brave And in my heart you'll always stay Forever young, forever young, forever young Build a stairway to heaven with a prince or a vagabond And may you never love in vain And in my heart you will remain Forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young
when you finally fly away I'll be hoping that I served you well For all the wisdom of a lifetime No one can ever tell But whatever road you choose I'm right behind you, win or lose Forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young.